Yellowstone supervolcano, why the USGS predicted a month-long eruption in July would bury the United States in ash. This is today's article on Express UK by Callum Hoare. USGS scientists and Yellowstone Volcano Observatory demonstrated during a lecture a shocking simulation of Yellowstone Volcano and uh, what would happen if it had a month-long eruption in July showing that it would bury the northern United States, the northern states of the U.S. in three feet of ash. The Yellowstone Volcano, as we know, is one of the few dozen volcanoes on Earth labeled a supervolcano for its ability to expel more than 250 cubic miles of ash and debris. The plumes from such an eruption can, raise, uh, can rise up to 17 to 30 miles into the atmosphere. And you can imagine what that could do going around worldwide, not just over the United States, but above the cruise level of jets and can cause devastation on a global level. This type of event has occurred three times in the past at the Yellowstone location, 2.1 million years ago, 3.1.3 uh, million years ago and 630,000 years ago. It had a smaller eruption 70,000 years ago and it has had over 6,000 eruptions since then. There are USGS geologists who claim that it's overdue for an eruption by about 10,000 years. Larry Mastin, a USGS hydrologist, worked with fellow colleague Jacob Lowenstern in 2016 to produce a paper on the ash fall impacts in the event of another Yellowstone super eruption. We're talking about the big eruptions, we're not talking about the smaller ones. Now, speaking during a public lecture that same year, he explained the objective was to see how the growth of umbrella clouds would affect ash distribution from Yellowstone. He said, we did a few dozen simulations, starting with an erupted volume of a few hundred cubic kilometers of magma. So this is, if you consider the volume of tephra that expands as it erupts, the volume of the tephra blanket that forms would be a few times greater than that of the magma alone. Amazing. And he goes on to explain, so this would be comparable to a tephra volume over a thousand cubic kilometers. We used a duration that ranged from three days to one month and an umbrella cloud height that ranged from about 15 to 35 kilometers. That's nine to 18 miles into the atmosphere. The wind fields were randomly chosen from historic patterns, but turns out they are actually not that important. Mr. Maston then demonstrated how a Yellowstone super eruption would bury the majority of Northern America, North America in ash, with some regions more heavily affected. He detailed how the duration of the eruption, or even the time of the year, seemed to make little change on its consequences. He said, so in these simulations you can see that over a three-day period, this umbrella cloud covers most of North American continent just in three days. Then it gradually disperses with wind patterns so you can look at the tephra deposit in these four different three-day simulations. One in January, one in April, one in July, and one in October. The pale yellow is one to three millimeters, three to 10, 10 to 30, and 30 to 100, 100 to 300, and the dark regions are over a meter of ash, which is over three feet of ash. If you go to a one-week duration, the pattern looks pretty similar, and for one month it is fairly the same. But as you go to one month, we're decreasing the average eruption rate, which is weakening the growth of the umbrella cloud. It comes after it was previously revealed how parts of Yellowstone National Park were closed after recording an uplift in the caldera. In 2003, Changes in the Norris Geyser Basin, that's where we have the steamboat geyser that's recently been going off since March of last year, and now recently even the ledge geyser is going off. They're both found in the Norris Geyser Basin, which is deforming and rising and also increasing in temperature. 
So in 2003, changes at the Norris Geyser Basin resulted in the temporary closure of some trails in the basin. New fumaroles were observed, and several geysers showed enhanced activity and increased water temperatures. Mr. Lowenstein, sorry, Mr. Lowenstern, uh, was, uh, who was tasked with monitoring the activities of, for the USGS revealed during the lecture at Menlo Park, California, why the park was closed. He said, around that time, there was a lot of hydrothermal activity in the Norris Geyser Basin area and a new linear vent that formed the Nymph Lake. It formed some really loud jet-like thermal features and a lot of trees died in the area in that time and park geologists spent quite a bit of time documenting the changes. Later that summer, there was a whole region in the Norris Geyser Basin, the Back Basin, where there was anomalous activity in a lot of the geysers and the ground temperature was increasing greatly and a lot of pools that were turned into steam vents or fumaroles. Here's an example of a thermal image taken on one of the trails. You see some of the temperatures are hitting above 50 degrees Celsius, but some reach the boiling point of water. If you were walking barefoot, you would have been pretty uncomfortable. So the Park Service closed off the back basin for a period of about a month and things cooled off and went back to normal. Yellowstone Park was closed after the caldera uplift caused a 100 degree Celsius ground temperature, which is of course boiling point. Callum Hoare Express UK goes to report Yellowstone volcano scientists recommended parts of the National Parks Trails should be closed after recording an uplift in the caldera. It was revealed during the lecture at Menlo Park. The supervolcano located below Yellowstone National Park sits between the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho and is constantly being monitored by USGS due to the capability to inflict disaster on a global scale if a super eruption occurs. The last event of this kind has not happened for more than 630,000 years, and any serious eruption in 70,000 years, which reportedly makes another super eruption overdue. In 2003, changes at the Norris Geyser Basin resulted in the temporary closure of some trails in the basin. New funerals were observed, several geysers showed enhanced activity and increased water temperatures. Jacob Lowenstein, see here it's spelled Lowenstein, in the other article it was spelled Lowenstern. I'll say Lowenstein. Uh, please forgive me if I have your name wrong. Jacob Lowenstein, who was t uh, tasked with the monitoring, the activity for USGS revealed during the lecture why the park was closed. It formed some really loud jet-like thermal features and a lot of trees died in the area. In that time, the park geologist spent quite a bit of time documenting the changes. Later that summer, there was a whole region in the Norris Geyser Basin, the Back Basin, where there was anomalous activity and a lot of the geysers, and the ground temperature was increasing greatly, and a lot of pools that were turning into steam vents or fumaroles. An example uh, of the thermal image taken on the trails, you can see some of the temperatures are hitting above 50 degrees Celsius, but some reached boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. If you were walking barefoot, you would have been pretty uncomfortable, so the parks closed off the back basin for a period of about a month, and things cooled off and went back to normal. But after carrying out the analysis of activity, the USGS scientist noted an uplift in the caldera, which he believed was caused, causing magma to seep under the trails. That's unbelievable. Can you imagine walking under the magma? The magma is boiling under your feet. You don't even know it. Mr. Lowenstein added another thing that happened in this time period was steamboat geyser. It went off six different times between 2000 and 2005, with most of them happening in 2002 and 2003. Then it went to bed after 2005 and did not erupt again until 2013. Okay, well, what would he say now that it's erupting every single week? Almost like clockwork. Uh, our colleague Chuck Wicks created an interferogram with the northern part of the caldera, which experienced uplift. 
He hypothesized that the uplift in that area may have caused some magma to get inside and push up on the crust. That causes tensions and may have been enough to allow more of the deep theming fluids to get out and cause the ground heating. It comes after Mr. Lowenstein revealed how more than 500 earthquakes between December 2008 and January 2009 made USGS nervous. He said it was a pretty nervous time for us, not because there was a lot of earthquakes, but because people were getting rather agitated about things happening beneath the lakes. Lakes freak people out for some reason because they can't see what is happening. So people just hypothesized all sorts of crazy stuff, and it was a very serious, nervous time. There was a lot of earthquakes, but there was never any steam or anything more than small earthquakes. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.